This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. This is a show about ideas, people, and behaviors that are considered inappropriate, out of bounds, or beyond the pale. The things you're not supposed to talk about if you're a school teacher, a college professor, a businessman, a politician, a parent, a neighbor, or even a podcast host. These are the things you're not supposed to say or even think if you're a good liberal, a good conservative, or a good citizen. Each week, I'll interview a person who has something bad to say. They might be a journalist or a professor. They might be a porn star or a drug dealer. They might just be an ordinary person with an ordinary job who doesn't care about the rules of polite society. I'm not interested in breaking the rules just to be a troublemaker. I'm interested in people who break the rules of conventional thought and to expand the scope of what is possible to say in our society. I'm interested in people who make me think. Since we launched the brand new Renegade University a few weeks ago, the world has changed. We have new courses, new faculty, many, many new students who are joining this new revolution in higher education. We have a new, unique educational platform that features video courses, one-on-one -on -one interaction with instructors, and a plethora of live events across the country. And right now, as part of our grand new launch, we're offering 30 to 40% off everything at the brand new Renegade University. To experience RU 2.0, go to renegadeuniversity.com. So I'm in San Francisco with Midori, very well known among a certain very bad subculture here <laughs> and, and abroad, nationally and internationally. But I was struggling with how to introduce you. I think I'd rather have you tell me how you would like to be introduced. Who are you? Oh, cool. Awesome. Okay. I'm Midori. That covers pretty much everything. All right. So let's break that on down. I've been ex uh, described as an elegant provocateur, sometimes a catalyst. I am usually childish and sometimes like way old geezer beyond my age. I seem to revolve around expressing and sharing creativity. My day job is as I run a company about sexuality education, and that's fundamentally about being authentically creative in a collaborative way. And my other career track is as an artist, which is about being authentically creative in my self-expression while collaborating with as many cool people as I can. Uh-huh. So you're not just a pervert, is what you're trying to say? Nah. Nah, not just that. Because to America, that's what you would be. Okay. <laughs> Well, if that's the entry way to start a conversation with me, I welcome that. No. So yeah. I'm thinking, yeah. how would you respond to that? Cool, thanks. Right. Yeah. And why? Why would you say cool, thanks? Um, you San Francisco pervert? Yeah. Well, I mean, San Francisco, well, I was going to say San Francisco is cool, but then that's a whole nother conversation about how San Francisco has been changing. Um, yeah, I live in San Francisco. I'm a Pacific Rim person. I'm a pervert. Yeah. You know what? I think that's a... You've been teaching people yeah. to do perverted things for a very long time, Midori. I think you should own that. Yeah, I totally do. Yeah. Um, but it's not that I just teach people how to do perverted things. I, I, I'm a pervert, or there's a Japanese word, skebe, S-U-K-E-B-E, -E, which is pervert. Huh. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and you embrace it. Yeah. And there's a certain joy to it, the word skebe. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's slightly lecherous, slightly goofy. Oh, it's, it's not it's not like our pervert, which is just nah, negative. No, nah, no, think more like Groucho Marx. Oh, nice. Yeah. So they're even lighthearted about perversion over there. Yeah, 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 yeah. I want to talk definitely about Japanese sexual culture in a minute. Oh, God, I, know you're, I have an entire lecture on that. I you know? know you do. Oh, yeah. I know you do. Yeah. I, know I don't you're get an to do that one often. It's fascinating. Well, yeah. I've been studying Japan very differently. I've been looking at World War II and its aftermath and some of the, the culture that came out of that you were a oh, part of. Oh, yeah, yeah, because I'm definitely a Showa kid. Uh-huh. Uh, Showa, for those of you out there who don't know, is one of the imperial, the names of the imperial era. In Japan, we use the, the Gregorian calendar as well as the Japanese imperial calendar. 
So when you give your birth date, you have to remember both your your Western year as well as your Japanese imperial year. And that also depends if you're doing with modern imperial calendar or the old country or Chinese continental calendar. Hmm. Yeah, complicated. But yeah, I'm part of the Showa era, which, yeah. So you're born, you were born in Kyoto. Yes, born and in you're Kyoto. Raised in Tokyo. Raised in Tokyo. But not so Americans who haven't been in Tokyo, and even probably a lot who have been in Tokyo, have particular ideas about it, right? What oh, it looks yeah. like, what it's yeah, like. Yeah. Maybe, Depends on which t- which tour guide book you use. Exactly. Yeah. And, wh- and whether they saw Lost in Translation. Lost in Translation is spot on. That's what I was wondering. It I is thought so. spot on. It seems like if I've never been there. Is this yeah. true? So Lost in Translation. Great movie with uh, Scarlett Johansson. Scarlett Johansson, very Bill, early, and Bill Murray. Yeah, and Bill Murray. And I'll hear people going, "Oh, that's you know, it's it's uh, cultural misappropriation. It's Orientalist. Blah blah blah. It's inaccurate. Bullshit." Oh, I can swear on this. Yeah, it's uh, encouraged. Okay, yeah. awesome. <laughs> yeah, but not required. Okay, yeah. so that analysis is. I consider that analysis itself bullshit because it's overly sensitive white people trying to protect people who don't need to be protected. Why I think Lost in Translation is spot on is it is entirely first person and owns its subjectivity. Mm. It's Bill Murray's experience of being dislocated and unmoored. Hmm. Now, first of all, him feeling disconnected and unmoored in his marriage, which is one of the central themes of the movie. I mean, that stands alone. And I think it was very sensitive, sensitively handled. Mm-hmm. Disconnected, is that, was that the yeah. word? And unmoored? Yeah. So you were born to a Japanese, no, sorry, an American woman mm-hmm. and a Japanese father who you didn't really know, correct? Mm-hmm. Correct. And before we turned on the microphones, you said that you didn't look like anyone, not just in your family, but in your world. Yes. Because you look, I guess, mixed. not quite Japanese, not quite American, mixed, yeah. different, right? And so yeah. you were in an American family because your father was out of the picture, but right. you were in Japan. And right. You, so you didn't look like anybody. Right. So, I mean, that, I'm wondering how, what, what, what do you attribute to that in terms of your career? Your um, subsequent path. Well, let's see. Subsequent path. All right. Does that have see. anything to do with it? It seems like it. Yeah, yeah. Um, can I finish the movie thing you and then totally dive into this? You can totally do whatever you want. You're yeah, I, thank I you. I can't stop you. Um, I really encourage people to see Lost in Translation because I think it's a great movie around how it feels like to be suddenly dropped into another culture. There's that. And then... Tokyo, especially Shinjuku and the entertainment district, is absolutely dizzying. Mm -hmm. And there are all these unwritten rules that nobody explains to you because the so much of the Japanese way is internalized social contracts, then they don't bother to explain because communication skills in Japan, you have a monolingual, monocultural, hive thinking culture where people don't even finish their Sentences. Sentences. Thoughts. Yeah. and the, Paragraphs. The, right. And so there's this like monolithic assumption of genes equal culture equals language equals thought, which also connect that to an ability to commit great atrocities in Manchu Kuo yep. whilst engaging in precise hospitality, civility, and kindness within the personal life. Right. So the boundary of the self and other is so tightly knit that the others do not require explanation of how the in crowd does things. And yeah, so Lost in Translation is a fantastic experience of one person dropping into the entertainment quarter of of Shinjuku and I think it's spot on. Yeah. Yeah. And those karaoke rent room bars, those are really damn cool. Huh. Yeah, I highly encourage that. I so when you watch that movie, there's Bill Murray who's all alone and depressed and lonely and stuck in this high rise apartment or I guess hotel with mm-hmm. it's sort of it's sort of soulless, right? And Scarlett Johansson decides to go out and explore and eventually takes him out into the into the demi monde yes. of Tokyo, right? Yes. Which you've just been describing. Yes. And for me, when I saw that many years ago, it was somewhat of a shock, certainly a surprise to see 
the exuberant expression of desire and pleasure mm -hmm. all across mm -hmm. Japanese, what seemed to be Japanese pop culture at that mm -hmm. level, right? Pop commercial Exactly, culture. which runs counter yeah. to an older stereotype of Japanese that Americans have held. Well, there are several stereotypes. Mm -hmm. None of them have been of Japanese people as fun-loving sexual types, right? It's usually either they're killing, they're murderous beasts during World War II, or they're uptight automobile executives in the 70s and 80s, or I don't know what we think of them now, but yeah. right. And so there's this Americans have thought of Japanese in these sort of schizophrenic ways or these split ways. Right, right. And I've heard you talk about this. Mm -hmm. um, the Japanese culture sexually is neither repressed nor hedonistic, or maybe it's both simultaneously. How would you describe it? So there's a difference between repression and modesty. Mm -hmm. There's a difference between um, internalized denial versus understanding the context of where one can engage in hedonism. Mm -hmm. So, um, Americans, I think even more so than Europeans, because Europeans have left the Judeo-Christian yoke behind and have become far more secularized mm -hmm. and, you know, following more the enlightenment, um, now, you know, given with the current migration tension, there's a whole nother argument to be had. But North Americans are pretty notoriously stuck in a Calvinist moralistic perspective. Indeed. Yay, Calvin. Um, <laughs> Not my favorite guy. No, no. I've, I've written extensively about this, yeah. yes. So there's this understanding that, that sexual discomfort or this perception that sexual discomfort in a context has to automatically about repression and guilt. But I think in Japan, it's not so much guilt in that Judeo-Christian way. I, I tend to think of just broad strokes, like mm -hmm. rule of thumb kind of explanation for me to mix metaphors. Um, think of American sexuality as predicated upon the vertical vertical being guilt hmm. and horizontal being shame. And I'm using that distinction as guilt as this idea that there is an omniscient other, that there is a concrete rule by which things must be done mm -hmm. that is constant and unchangeable whether you be across context. The omniscient other, yeah. otherwise known as God, or or morality. Right, right, right. It could be a secular morality. Yes, but it's that's omniscient. Yes, and, and American secular morality, including American secular law, is based upon the the Old and New Testament. Correct. And, I, I agree with you anyway. Yeah, yes, absolutely. And, and it's based upon pre Enlightenment. Um, that's an excellent point. It's true. The Old Testament is much more much more prominent in our sexual culture, isn't it? Yes. Yes. That's yes. right. So American laws and morality, even secular morality, are based upon a biblical foundation regardless of how you're raised. Mm -hmm. The idea that there is a concrete fairness, mm -hmm. right? That there is a good and a bad. Binary, black and yeah, white, and mannequin. There is, right. there is a sin and, and, and sin and saintliness. Right. Um, Whereas in Japan, again, broad brushstroke, look at this as shame and a horizontal power, horizontal pressure, right? Instead of a vertical pressure, horizontal pressure, meaning where do you fit in among the humans and the world that we live in? And, 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 and throw into that an animus culture and you also include objects and space. Mm -hmm. Because you know, space is a loaded thing. Sure. Space is coded with, with, with class and and access and privilege, right? Mm -hmm. So then, when you think of Japanese morality as not causing disharmony, okay, harmony, and I'm not talking harmony like woo. Let's meditate. But in other words, don't rock the boat. Social order. Social order, yep. not making others uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. So you have this pressure that is horizontal. Am I behaving appropriately to my place and context and the hat that I wear? Now that changes by where you're at. Now earlier I mentioned um, the behavior of, say, a Japanese person that is happens to be a soldier in Manchuria. 
may also own a noodle shop in Osaka. Mm -hmm. Where he's a very kind, kindly man to the customers. But yeah. in Manchuria, he was doing something very, very different to the people around him. Right. That's what you're getting at, right? Exactly. Right. So there's a split again. Yeah. Maybe sort of a violent, almost savage person over here. But at home, it's, in the home country, it, it's context. You must be, you yeah. must obey the laws of the rules of etiquette. Right. 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 To maintain harmony or social order. Right. Yeah. So the pressure is social. You're and saying, when, you, when you think of the harmony and social order as if you are just a conscript in mainland China, right. what do you do? They tell you to kill, you kill. Mm -hmm. Is it savagery? Who's okay? Mm -hmm. Maybe the people designing the entire, well, okay. The generals, maybe, but is it? Right. To me, it, yeah. and maybe to you, it was savagery, but obviously to them it wasn't. It was a necessary conquest. It was a necessary conquest, and if you're just Mr. Soldier, dude. Sure. And if you're just a cog in the wheel yeah. of a culture, and Japan as a culture is a baby compared to the continent. You know? I'm thinking about the sources of... Pain, suffering, worry, guilt, shame, whatever you want to call it, about mm -hmm. sex and sexuality in both mm -hmm. countries. So I know this country pretty well and the sexual history of it and the sexual culture here. And I think you described it really well um, that it is. I love this this idea of the, it being uh, vertical, mm -hmm. coming originally from God, mm -hmm. the guilt or the shame, whatever you want to call it. Kind it could be either one, by the way. Monotheistic. Monotheistic. Yeah. Uh, because is, the polytheists are load of fun. This, yeah, that's just complicated for me. I don't know. I don't know if I can handle that. Uh, you're told what is good and what is bad. Sex is always bad within that in various ways. And it's, and it's passed down almost literally sometimes from the parents or it's just from reading the Bible. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, but it's individualistic. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're getting at. Right. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's the verticality maybe of it. So, and God doesn't need to be there as you said, he's omniscient or she or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Right. Or just the morality is mm -hmm. omniscient always there. You can be all alone in your bedroom and still be suffering tremendously. Mm -hmm. Having, so, having pleasures and desires so by yourself. I, like if a, um, let's say some American boy, Joe, Joe's like jacking off alone in the forest. He may still be committing a sin. Precisely. If um, uh, Akira, average Japanese name, is jacking off in a forest, he needs a tissue. Yeah. Are they? <laughs> is that really true? I mean, they're really that cool about as long as the context is correct, you can jack off whenever and however you want and with whomever. Yeah. You know, it makes it easy for otaku culture because you're like behind a closed door. Uh-huh. Right. Okay. Right. So, and this so also, when you don't have to interact with other people, it takes a lot of pressure off. And does this also explain why there's is there still a, there is a red light district in Tokyo? Oh yeah, yeah. Right, and there Thank is not God. here. Yeah. Which is amazing. I mean, you could almost call San Francisco one giant red light district, well, but it's not God, really. But remember it's not when really. North Beach used to be full of like I sure do. great strip joints I sure and do. like the yeah, condor. yeah, yeah, the sure. condor, yeah, and like the lusty lady, That's right. and then. Um, South of Marca, you would get, you know, the God, I was talking to somebody recently about how like the alleys are just like not a fun place to like have random sex anymore. Mm -mm. Yeah. You'll get accidentally stabbed by a needle. Yeah. You, you know, either that or someone working in a tech company is going to come out and walk <laughs> into you because they're looking at their phone. Correct. That's much more likely, actually. <laughs> they get stabbed by an iPhone. Yeah. So the, uh, I, I really, so the pressure in Japan though, conversely, you're saying comes, it's social. It's, it's from the people around you within your village or city or town or within the military unit you're serving in or whatever it is. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the pain and suffering, I suppose that's guilt because mm -hmm. that's, you're worried about other people in that yeah. situation. Yeah, no, Shame I, I, is I, about, you feel bad about yourself. Right. Um, yeah. I've or, actually been calling it the other way. Yeah, I guess but, I, yeah, I don't know if it yeah, matters too much, yeah, but I, I, yeah, I think we agree. The horizontal versus the vertical. That's what I yeah, like. Yeah. And the dynamic you're and, describing makes sense. And to it me. also yeah. creates that electric third rail of okay. what charges sexuality mm. and what charges, what creates the charge and okay. what would be considered perverted. Oh, good. Okay. Now we're getting into the good stuff. Right. Okay. So tell me about the third rail in each country. All right. So again, broad brush strokes here. Yep. Mm -hmm. I find that, that it has a lot more to do with breaking common social norm rules. And it's interesting now that, that there's discussion and more media ease around discussing poly and non-binary relationships. Yeah. 
right? Because Isn't that that, interesting. All of a sudden, yeah. people are talking about that. Right. And, you know, it's never all of a sudden because it's been bubbling in the fringes. Sure. Uh, but now things like poly. And well, we have this congresswoman. You see this recently. She was outed as a poly person yeah. just recently by her husband and had to resign because of it. Poly and bisexual. Right. Oh, dear. You, yeah. you lose your job. Yeah. That, still. Yeah. So you have that thou shalt only be, you know, one one on one. Like this For, is the freaking Noah's Ark mm -hmm. forever. Until you die. You're yeah. 18. Until yeah. you die, you're yeah. going to be having sex with this one person. And yeah. this is the way it's supposed mm -hmm. to be. So you get these like big pillars of sexual rules. So I think if we look at porn, right, if we look at American porn, it's a great way to look at how does it deal with the area, gray area of taboo that feeds and fuels pornography because that's a place that a cultural sexual taboo that is just really actually quite common. Mm -hmm. You know, people are like really, really trying hard to abide by things, but it doesn't quite work that way in real life. Sort and of like the taboo against oral sex until yeah. the 1970s, which was considered to be a deviation by the American Psychiatric Association yeah. until then, right? I mean, yeah. and, and of course, but everyone was doing it anyway. Yeah. Is that what you mean? Like, yeah. It was a taboo, but it was commonly violated. It was taboo, but uncomfortably violated. And yeah. you also get into different demographics. Mm -hmm. um, like, okay, so, so going down on a woman may be easier for easier and just like normal for say an under 40 white male privileged popular straight white male privileged population whereas that's going to be a very different thing than a 40 and over african-american guy on average yeah, yeah you know it's speaking in broad strokes here. Yeah, yeah speaking in yeah. broad strokes yeah. but there's going to be cultural pressures sure so even saying american makes it really difficult. You get urban and rural, you get different ethnic divisions, you get migration generations. Absolutely. Yeah. So, but if we take something like the American Psychiatric Association saying, oh, this is, you know, perverted. Now that, that gives us an actual calendar date and time in a publication DSM version that right. we can demark a shift in a culture. Mm. Thank you, DSM, for helping us fill out our calendars right. when we're writing the history. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. remarkable, though, that oral sex, according to the psychiatrist, yeah. was considered to be a sexual uh, deviation? Right. Yeah. As yeah. well as masturbation. As was masturbation. Um, right. Yeah. And today, how often do we use the word promiscuity as opposed to poly or right. dating or hooking up? Right. If a woman in her 30s hasn't had a certain amount of sexual experience, her friends will be like, oh, honey. We need to go out. Let's make a profile for you on a dating side. <laughs> Girlfriend, let's get up to speed here. Indeed. Whereas, it, not long ago. It was a mark of shame. Yeah. And now it's a mark sometimes of pride. Or mark of normalcy. Or normalcy, right. Yeah. Exactly, right. Can we go back to Japan? Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I'm really interested in where precisely, specifically, you grew up in Tokyo because you've talked about this in sure, other places. Sure. The neighborhood, right? Yeah. Again, I think is going to be different than what most Americans imagine Tokyo to be like, right? Yeah, I grew up in residential area just west of Shinjuku. This is an area that people as tourists are not going to go into. And at the train station that I would get off on, that, and I don't mean it that way. <laughs> in the air. Or, 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 or. Yeah, the train station on the north side of the sta train station was the last of the post-war shanty market mm. so there were all these tiny it, it was it was like a favela mm. right mm -hmm. all these tiny little shops with corrugated cardboard roof that somehow ended up covered over and it was like this maze it was this maze of, and i loved going in there right it's a shanty town yeah. i guess right well yeah shanty market shanty, okay right yeah. uh -huh. and and japanese being who we are made it kind of nice and it was n never really dirty until like after the bar hours. And then, you know, the, what I remember of the smell of streets of Tokyo after a certain time, late night was a smell of urine and barf. Just right? like here. Yeah. Yeah. And then morning actually was um, the smell of water on concrete. 
Okay. As the shopkeepers would be cleaning off and people would be saying good morning. But yeah, we had like the one of the last of the post-war markets. And that's how I feel very much connected to the Showa Emperor Hirohito era. And there's a whole different Showa um, and Heisei and whatever the new era is that hasn't, I can't even remember because um, it just happened this year. Mm -hmm. Uh, there's a split with the Showa ethos and morality and the post-Showa people, right, that gets talked about in Japan. But yeah, my neighborhood had that shanty market. I grew up in essentially a tenement building, okay. working class neighborhood. You know, some of the people in the neighborhood might have been school teachers, but there were, I had friends whose single mom worked at night and people said nothing there were, you know, the my best friends. My best friend's dad was a tatami maker, hmm. like handmade tatami. The tofu guy would come every day to the, at a certain time to the end of our block on his bicycle with a wooden crate with fresh tofu. And let let me tell you, man, the stuff that passes for tofu in this country, <laughs> yeah, is we're getting cheated. Crap. Oh yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like calling craft singles. Cheese. Oh my God, it's that bad? Yeah. Ooh. Uh huh. Okay. Yeah. I gotta fly a long way to get good oh, tofu. Good yeah, tofu, good though. tofu. Good tofu. Um, there are a couple of restaurants around that make actually house made tofu, and it's like the finest fresh cheese. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's so good. Of course, you know what I'm doing right now, right? Yeah. I'm trying mm -hmm. to figure out how to connect this back to sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, working class neighborhood and and see, there was the communal bathhouse where oh, we... Yeah. you just connected. Okay, thank you very yeah. much. There's a communal bathhouse, but then there was the um, Toruko Furo, or Turkish bath. Huh. But Toruko, which they no longer use because the Turkish embassy complained vehemently, was the code for soap land. So you have two kinds of baths. If you go to Japan, please be careful what kind of bath you go yeah, to. Please help here. Okay. Yes. So there is the, the G-rated bath, and then there's the X-rated bath. Hmm. The G-rated bath, there's a few varieties in that. There's, there's the nothing, there's no R? There's no. nothing in between? Not really. Okay. Yeah. You it's have, just Winnie the Pooh or it's deep throat. One yeah. Of the, you, okay. Yeah. Okay. And if you want a deep throat while wearing a Winnie the Pooh outfit, there's a club for that too. That I was, that's for the later okay. in the conversation. Right. When yeah. we get to your career, yeah. we'll get to that. Yeah. yeah okay. Can, gotcha. Yeah. yeah. And the G-rated one is the one that, that I grew up with because my building and this was this was a common thing in my neighborhood. Just to be clear to the listeners, that Japanese homes did not, unless they were out in the country, did not have their own bath. Hmm. Okay, you had your toilet. I'm not talking about not having a toilet. Mm -hmm. You didn't have your own bath. You went to the neighborhood bathhouse. Hmm. If you were working class, I guess. I mean, certainly the wealthy had baths, didn't they? In the super wealthy. It was, but, oh, really? It was that uncommon to have a bath in your home? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You just, you know, you kind of, it's kind of like taking the subway in New York. Wow. You know? Okay. Yeah. At the end of the day, middle class, working class folks, mom, dad, and the kids and grandma and whatever would get their little toiletries in their little bucket and go walking over to the neighborhood bath, which by the way, uh, in immigrant neighborhoods in New York, also around the time where there were tuberculosis outbreaks, also had public bathing. That's right. Right. Yeah. And, you know, of course, let's call the Romans for inventing this fantastic tradition mm -hmm. for Europe that then Europeans abandoned. Right. To become very stinky people. Okay. Yeah. So and that then, was that was sort of a common thing. They for, just did. For yeah. the ordinary Japanese. Yeah. Okay. You just ordinary Japanese. You take your shoes off, you get a little locker, you take your clothes off and, and you're naked. Yeah. You're naked. In front of strangers. Yeah. For yeah. God's well, sake, you not, people. Yeah, they're not they're not strangers, they're neighbors. Even worse. Yeah. <laughs> and so what was cool. <laughs> that's amazing. That's yeah. really I mean, that that's gonna clash with the American mind really uh, hard. And what that's was great. really yeah. cool was um and you would think that So you're you know, not such a repressed people, we're finding out. Here. No, yeah. no, because yeah. everybody goes to the bath. Or repressed maybe in a different way, or maybe that's yeah. just a wrong word. Modesty. Fascinating. Yeah. Okay, so modesty. modesty. That's what you would call it. Yeah. And even the modesty is like, all right, you'll clean your genitals thoroughly. You know, there's like this 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 bank of of uh, stools, mirrors, 
and sink and where we all sit like side by side and scrubby, 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 wash your hair, wash your hair, gossip, gossip. You would think that this would be like all people imagine in the West that this would be all like Zen. Like, oh my God, you go to Kabuki Hot Spring in San Francisco, it drives me nuts because they insist on quiet and mm. like that's somehow supposed to be authentically Japanese. It's not. <laughs> it's not. People are gossiping and cackling and, you know, because I went to the girl's side, the women's side bath, right? So there'll be, and I got to see all sorts of bodies, baby bodies, teenage bodies, you know, um, wrinkly old people body, pregnant body, you know, middle-aged sagging ass body, whatever. You saw all of that. And everybody's naked. Yeah. Well, for God's sake. Right. And what, so, what are we going to do with these people? Yeah, it's great. Now, and right down the street, you're saying, or maybe even next door, where's the X-rated one? Right. The How close? Soapland. So, uh, what's this? What's, soapland what's, I don't know what that is. is. So prostitution is illegal in Japan. Mm -hmm. But like any culture, they find all sorts of ways to legitimize mm -hmm. their way around. Mm -hmm. People who work at, at Soaplands, some are exploited. Some are survival workers in the scale of various um, unofficial sex work in Japan, like there is in the U.S. There's different hierarchies of it. Mm -hmm. So soapland workers probably lower on the, the unofficial rung of sex work hierarchy and the, the labor force there. Uh, what happens is usually male customers go in for a bath and a bath attendant will scrub you thoroughly with their body. Mm. Mm. Is it just that? Is it just the rubbing of the bodies together? Or is there penetration of any kind? Probably. Okay. Probably. Yeah. yeah. Cause that's, you know, over here in the West, mm -hmm. that's a pretty important line we draw. So there's, yeah. And which is kind of interesting because in, it isn't, isn't in, it interesting? Yeah. Like in why, Japan, why do we draw the line there? Right? Yeah. In yeah. Japan, erotic entertainment is, is looked at as a, as a broader scope, mm -hmm. like the higher priced sensual entertainment oftentimes has more to do with showing your economic and social prowess. Mm -hmm. So if you have a membership to a fancy erotically themed bar, right, and you're a regular and you bring your coworkers and your colleagues to this bar, now sexy dressed workers making small talk flirtation, sexy shows happening, very expensive whiskey, mm -hmm. right? And Western visitors will be confused because you know, is, is this somebody where I can grab the tit or can I grab pussy or can I grab genitals? Can I like, you know, fuck this person right here? Well, no, because that's not the unspoken rule and the etiquette of the space. Private arrangements, I'm sure, can be made. Mm -hmm. However, this, like the equivalent of a modern day tea house, is where you pay large amounts of money for professional entertainers who tell dirty jokes and do suggestive shows they are technic they are not prostitutes hmm. but they provide erotic entertainment mm -hmm. as in delighting your senses while mr man who's got the who's got the membership or is a regular is paying millions of yens and showing off how big and hard his wallet is mm -hmm. So I remember the stereotype when I was growing up of the Japanese businessman, mm -hmm. really this applied to all Japanese because we didn't even differentiate, you know, you're mm -hmm. all the same, uh, mm -hmm. is that, you know, work all week long at Toyota headquarters mm -hmm. and then, you know, on the one night on the weekend, you go absolutely berserk and spend all this money and fuck 97 prostitutes and get wildly drunk and then and blackout on, drunk and blackout yeah. drunk. And then Monday with, you go back with yeah. your colleagues. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That, at least that was what we were told was going yeah. on. Is that at all? Yeah. Correct. Or, yeah. Okay. And that has gone by the wayside with the economic bubble bursting as well as the disillusionment of a whole new generation. I was going to say, we've now, now we're hearing that the Japanese are not having sex at all anymore. That's correct. Yeah. And what's your explanation for this? Unraveling of a culture. Yeah? Yeah. Which one? The traditional or the modern? Or both? Um, both. Because, uh -huh. well, let's see. Um, the forced modernization that happened with the, the visiting of Commodore Perry and then uh, oh, yeah. the whole revolution. And the occupation. And, and occupation, but right. also the Meiji rest revolutions. Yep. And... 
the British, the British governance structure also has a lot to do with this too. Mm -hmm. So you get this new, new hierarchy imposed upon an old hierarchy. Now, as of end of World War II, you now have the emperor is no longer a descendant of a god, a living god. You have this culture going splat, but if you, um, technical term, <laughs> um, <laughs> still the, the heads of the noble houses and the warrior houses essentially still have control of the resources. So you get Mitsubishi. Yeah. Right. Where do they come from? They come from a warrior lineage, all the major companies, the old ones, right? The mid century and the eighties powerhouses. Yeah. Oh yeah, they're still. I mean, it's I, they it's, come from warrior. Well, it's kind of like yeah, it's like the House of Lords, okay. man. I mean, it's still the caste system. Didn't know that. Simply just flipped over into because you still have the network. Mm. You know, it's still like well, you know what what public uh, private school did you go to? Are you an Eton man? Okay, okay. Same thing. Okay, you I don't want to leave Japan yet, so I took yeah. you back to Japan, and now yeah. I want to take you. Not only back to Japan, not only back to your neighborhood, I want to take you back into your apartment building growing yeah, up yeah. with your mother, right? Yeah. It was an apartment? My mom and my grandma. Oh, your, yeah. oh, your grandma yeah, was yeah. there too. Okay. Yeah. And this was your mother's mother? Yep. And these are both white ladies from America? Yes. Correct. And your mother was an academic? Yes. A pretty high level academic? Yes. And what did she teach? Uh, Japanese literature. Well, retired now. But, That's yeah. impressive, yeah. right? An American woman or an American yeah. teaching Japanese literature in Tokyo at an elite university in Tokyo. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Smart, smart person. Yeah, smart. And I don't know how aware she was at the time of how uncommon, how revolutionary what she was doing was. Yeah. You know, this is back in the day when you could earn a tenure for actually publishing without necessarily going through the PhD racket. Mm. So... She got her tenure and professorship by content of her pure academic work. Hmm. By the now normal means of gaining tenure, she today she probably wouldn't because she didn't jump through all the the accreditation and the letters right. after the name. Okay. Yeah. And she met your father, who you don't really know. Yeah. He's a Japanese man, yeah. right? Yeah. And he was gone before you were born? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Or, I mean, gone before I had an awareness before of Before you were conscious. Yeah. Right. And so you, she was a single mom, I take it, mm -hmm. throughout your childhood? Yep. Oh, and, oh. except... Oh, um, well, she did have a common-law husband uh, by the time I was a teenager, Okay, but yeah, so mostly was, you were raised yeah, by a single mom. Though. Yeah, and yeah, I mean, I, yeah, and the the relationship with her her second common law the common law husband was like outside of my scope of being with my mom. And your grandmother was there too. Yes. And you told me before again we started recording that your mom was a lefty. She was oh a yeah. Was she a member? What did you say? A member of the Communist Party? Uh probably of some brand of intellectual socialist. Yeah. Yeah. Just like my mom. Yeah. Okay. So I know what her politics politics were, mm -hmm. right? But then what were her sexual politics? Prudish. Mm. Prudish, but idealistically liberal. Mm -hmm. I've yeah. known a few thousand people yeah. like that, yes. Idealistically liberal. Here's a woman who idolized, idolizes um, Queen Victoria. <laughs> wow. The queen herself. Yes. Why? Uh, well, my mom's really super short. I mean, she created an amazing empire. Amazing, so, yeah. yeah. You, um, you, you could know. call it that, yeah. Yeah, it, you know. <laughs> big, certainly. Big. Powerful. Uh, dominant. Big, powerful, dominant, and. Big, powerful, dominant. Yeah. An empire. Yeah. All created by a short woman. Yes. Mm hmm Yeah. Now I'm starting to see yeah, yeah, yeah. why she might have been attracted to this yeah. person. Yeah. Was your mom short? Uh, less than five feet. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay, I can yeah. see why Victoria would turn her on. Yeah. Now, there was a weird moment I had when I was in NASA um, uh, years ago. And Wait, NASA or Nassau? Nassau. Like um, in the Bahamas? Bahamas. Okay. Yeah. And I'm walking along the tourist area, right? Mm. And I look over and I see a statue of my mother. Uh huh. Like, and then I look again and it's young Queen Victoria. And I'm like, oh, looks just like my mother. Oh, wait, my mother looks just like young Queen Victoria. Oh, 
That I'm, was kind of weird. I'm just, I'm sorry, right now, I'm just reeling from the fact that Midori's mother idolized Queen Victoria. Yeah. Big and powerful and imperialistic. You know, f- feminist <laughs> archetype. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what about Victoria's much more famous sexual politics? What does she think about those? I never asked. Maybe I should. But it, I think it was at a very political and a political and a, fe- a feminist level of being achieving success beyond beyond what any of the male rulers did it's that brand i never got that deep with her on on victoria but you didn't talk about sex with your mom sounds like you know the way that i was taught about sex came from my i remember my mom explaining to me about why species extinction is bad for the balance of the population so i kind of backed into thinking about sex from species propagation. What an odd path. Is it? I think so. Okay. It's an intellect it's a true intellectual's path, am I yeah. right? To yeah. so, sexual knowledge and understanding. Right. right? You so, start with a big idea. Yeah. So, not even a specific sexual idea, just about evolution. Right. Evolution. And, and so you, I'm looking at the lions and the zebras, right? Yeah. Okay. And like my mom's explaining about, well, you know, and she's Good, good lefty, uh, idealistic lefty. So anything involving a gun is bad, mm-hmm. right? So because you know, for my mom, anything with guns were bad. So the, you know, there might have been like a scene somewhere along the way. This is how I came to like, as I don't know, was I four, five? You know, looking at Marlon Perkins, and there's always Jim yeah. being wrestled by a large snake. Yeah, poor Jim. Always. And he was your he was your sex ed teacher. Apparently, and he yeah. didn't even know it. Yeah, poor guy. And so you know, look if what you, he created. If you kill all the lions, you get too many zebras. If you have too many zebras, all the grass gets eaten. Oh. If all the grass gets eaten, all the animals die. Uh-huh. And little Midori goes, "Oh, yeah, okay, so." And we have little lions because lions have sex. And then I, I, DNA was a really easy thing for me to understand. Yeah. Yeah. And so then people are animals and uh-huh. that just, yeah. Yeah. It was kind of easy. Yeah. But I mean, there's a lot of people who start with an interest in those things. DNA, evolution, Marlon Perkins, Jim in the woods with the antelopes, and so, et cetera. Yeah. Okay. How, do you, how do you get from animal kingdom to the streets of San Francisco in the way that you did. So now uh-huh. I, all of this is happening in the absence of Judeo-Christian guilt, uh-huh. but with the normalcy of modesty okay. of let's not make other people uncomfortable. Okay. Right. So I'm not having the guilt thoughts, uh-huh. but I'm having the, oh, there are things that, that are not appropriate in context. Right. There's a place for everything and everything is in its place or everything should be in it, right? And it, so you were contrasting mm-hmm. the West with Japanese culture, but now it sounds like maybe it was similar in that way. So like, as long as everything's in its place, compartmentalized correctly, what goes on within the compartment is okay. Yeah, was, because if you don't have the guilt factor, yep. if it's in the right compartment, it's okay. Whereas if you have a concretized idea of the permanence of guilt, mm-hmm then it doesn't matter in what box you put it in, it's still bad. Yeah. Okay, so we have the we have the G-rated bathhouse, which mm-hmm. you were experiencing, mm-hmm. which was... And and I would There walk, was no guilt and no shame there. No. You have Animal Kingdom, no guilt and no shame. Your mom's not talking about sex, so there's not really at least any explicit shaming or guilting going on from no. her or no. maybe grandmother either. So then are you just a free agent in the world where, where sex is completely harmless to you and it's just a, it's just a magical <laughs> playground? I think... The the time period that I grew up in Japan and the neighborhood I grew up in, there was um I got to be a kid longer. Mm. I got to be a kid longer. I didn't have exposure. I, I didn't really have like the the stranger danger thing. You know, you you come home when dinner was ready. You went out and played with with the other kids. The grandmas in the neighborhood would kind of keep an eye on you. And man, you know, if you were like an idiot, you know, like if you ended up like breaking somebody's window or something or whatever, or if some kid hit another and there's tears, Mm -hmm. you know that there's going to be some grandma that's going to be talking to another grandma. Mm -hmm. Indeed. Yeah. Just like here sometimes in certain neighborhoods. Yeah. 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 Although now there's no one on the streets at all in most American neighborhoods. People all are indoors or in their cars, especially the children. Yeah. We've locked them up apparently. Yeah. And so... 
I got to take my time, yeah. you know? Now, now, sure, little bit of curiosity stuff. I remember walking by the adult theater. Okay. Because the neighborhood had an adult theater. Aha. Uh -huh. Right? And I'd slow down and look at the posters, and I just keep walking. They look glamorous. Oh, yeah? Glamorous. Yeah. You know? That's the posters. word that comes to mind. Yeah. Huh. But they were often set in like historical melodrama. Oh, I see. Yeah. It had the academic edge. That's what got you. And there was a story. <laughs> yeah. There was a story. Oh. Hmm. Not so much academic, but there was a story. Okay. All right? Yeah. Yeah. A narrative. A narrative. So they just looked kind of glamorous. And okay. when I was growing up in Japan, so we're talking 70s, right? And this was, was this Japanese porn? Or, mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Because Western porn is considered like totally weird and right. bizarre. Right. Um, Which it is. It is. Yeah. According to the Japanese. So in the 70s, you had this brief period of feminism almost took hold. In Japan. <gasps> yes. In the 60s, who, who six, knew? 60s and 70s. Yeah. Now also think in terms of, um, now I love, okay, I, I wouldn't say I'm a cinephile, but I like movies. Mm -hmm. And mid-century Japanese movies are so interesting and so like avant-garde. And they cross the line between all sorts of different genres. And because not coming from this like forced puritanical Hollywood code, because the 30s like completely right. like... From, the thir from 1934 to 1965, Hollywood screwed, was ruled by the code. Right. And that screwed over. The Hollywood code has yeah. a lot to do with screwing over American sexuality. It created the closet. Now, right. Very much so, yeah. And it also created the images that were propagated. Clo when I say that, I mean the closet for everyone, by the right. way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> yeah. Now in, so, but in Japan, they didn't have Japan, a code. They well, they didn't, didn't have, have that code. They, they had didn't other have codes. that code. They right. had different codes, which yeah. was implemented by the occupying government. Yes. And yeah. the the censorship in Japanese media is not because of the Japanese. It's because of MacArthur. General MacArthur. I was yeah. just about to say this. Yeah. He, ran, he was the, basically the emperor of Japan immediately right. after the war. And they didn't the want to deal with things sexual, so don't show pubic hair, which, of course, Japanese pornographers figured out, hey, we have a razor. Took right. care of that one. Yeah. Now, that puritanical attitude of MacArthur, now we're going to bring it right back to Queen Victoria. It comes from now, now post-war Japan and uh, from from Commodore Perry through post-war Japan. Japan is trying to suck in all the best that there is yep. of what's out in the world. So you have French cooking, of course. You have which has been there, and the, the uh, Portuguese have influenced Japanese cooking for quite some time, long before. Uh, but you have the British parliamentary system, the German military system, German education system, the gymnasium and the exam system, um, and anything that was considered Western, exotic, not, not exotic, Western and modern, but rapidly incorporating yep. it, including the slow dissolution of the village bath. Mm-hmm. Aha. Here we go. Here we go. Connecting okay. with... All right. Nicely done. Yeah. yeah. And also the parliamentary structure, but also the laws, the British laws around sexual morality. Now, the British laws around sexual morality and what Queen Victoria put out into the world had more to do with um, Prince Albert, the Prussian prince. So Britain... Uh, before Victoria was fantastically randy. Yes. And then you insert German, mm -hmm. Prussian, Protestant, uh -huh. prudery. Yeah. So then we have, we owe it to the Prussian, Protestant, prudery to influence Queen Victoria, which subsequently influenced the occupying forces in Japan, which beget the uh, pixelization. Pixelization. The pixelizing genitals in porn. Oh, oh current, yes, right. When you watch Japanese porn, you can't right. see the, the... So it's not the Japanese, it's the You're Prussians. You're blaming us yes. and the Prussians. Yes. And by the way, on my white side, Prussian. Oh, my gosh. So my grandmother's grandfather, my grandmother's grandfather, yeah, my grandmother's grandfather, American side, German side, was secretary to, admin, uh, bureaucratic secretary to... Uh, uh, the Kaiser 
Wilhelm. My gosh. And was part of one of the various just, failed coups. So Japanese, German, and a sex radical. You're just nothing but the enemy. Yeah, right. Yeah. I and mean, I, I wear, how have you not been deported already? This I know, right? And like I wear, three times yeah, you should have been deported. I wear Italian shoes. So oh, do you? I, yeah, yeah. Okay. So there. And probably must be a Muslim as well. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. A, and a former communist. Yeah. So, uh -huh. okay. Yeah. Yeah. And we... We've not even, we, ha we, we haven't even gotten you to America yet. Let's do that. Yeah. So uh, when did you come over here to this uh, poor benighted country with, yeah. its, with its sexual hangups? Um, I came over when I was 14 because I couldn't hack it in Japan anymore. You couldn't hack it when no, you were 14? What do you no. mean by that? The academic pressure. Oh, that. Yeah. yeah. Academic pressure. And as a... Because you weren't smart enough? No. Not much of an intellectual, not yeah. good with the words and ideas and stuff like that. You know, what was cool was um, when in grade school and junior high, in a class of 40 students, my class, I was um, one of two kids who didn't get sent to cram school and additional education that we didn't ask for. Hmm. And we were both children of professors. Mm -hmm. No coincidence. Yeah. All right. I got to play and, you know. So how do we, you said you couldn't hack it though. I couldn't hack it. The pressure for the exams. Oh yeah. And the pressure for the exams and that you had to get into the, and then the big picture thing, it's like, what, you know, you got to pass the exam to get into a good high school, to get into a good college for what? Right. So I, I am, I am a mixed blood. I am a half breed child from a broken family, quote, broken family, because that, that mm -hmm. was not okay then mm -hmm. with a white mother, no father. And I'm actually not a Japanese citizen, although I'm born and raised because the Japanese government won't allow me a citizen. Because you're not racially pure. I'm not racially pure. And it's a racist government. And in, as constitution. a constitution and as a girl child, what's my access to success? What does, what's success? Hmm. You know, I didn't have the language as a kid, but now as an adult, how do I access power, privilege, ease, and self-expression? And how am I going to be myself in a culture where there is no self until recently? Hmm. The concept of self. Hmm. I don't have a citizenship. Hmm. I get fingerprinted every year by the Japanese government growing up there. Mm. I have to leave the country for, I thought it was summer vacation and visiting the relatives that we did every year. Oh. It was, but part of the permanent resident visa or the, the resident visa conditions at the time, I think it's changed. And for any of you who are living in Japan or people who know have permanent residency in Japan, this was the 60s and 70s. This is also the culture that my mom told me this story where my mom, white, my, my legal dad, her husband, white, they each kept their name when they got married. And when they came over to Japan to work, and she was the one that with the job, and he was coming over to see if he could find a job, he got pulled over by the authorities and interrogated as to why they had different names. Mm -hmm. Because you're legally obligated to change your name if you're a woman, and why is the woman the one with the work? Fairly patriarchal. Oh, yeah. Just a bit. So it's a patriarchal culture. Indeed. And I'm growing up in a matrilineal matriarchal culture. Yeah, you're just not going to work out at all. No. And so at around 14, this like unspecified discontent sets in. I didn't have the words to say that there's no future in this country. Now, by this time, my grandmother had already been inoculating me, my feminist suffragette, uh, pioneer daughter, daughter of American Revolution, um, social worker lady who wore pants, okay? <laughs> Here's a woman who wore pants from 1901 grandmother who wore a pants suit. Who had been slowly inoculating me and been making sure that I appreciate the culture I'm from, but I am not owned by Japan. And little things like, I, you know, I had the little like bowl, Japanese bowl girl haircut. Mm -hmm. She would take that and pin it up and say, you have such an intelligent brow. Huh. You should not hide it like the other little girls do. Huh. So she recognized that I was different and empowered my difference. Nice. So I'm 14. Yeah. Now in... The discontent, the American teenager discontent is sex, drugs, and rock and roll. I've right? heard. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. In Japan, you have 
one way out. Suicide. Oh. It's a reality. Oh, yeah. It's that common. Oh, yes. It's so common that I ran into some, a shopkeeper in, in San Francisco who's of my generation. And within half an hour of introducing ourselves and placing ourselves in the map that is Tokyo, turns out she's just north of Tokyo, we end up talking about suicide. You know, you just talk about it. I didn't know this. Oh, yeah. It's this common. Oh, yeah. And has been for generations, I suppose? I can't say for generation, but I know for my generation. When you said I, there's only one way out, I was about to say airplanes, but wow, that's... Suicide. Terrible and yeah. depressing. Yeah. And I don't know what to do with that information. Yeah, Puccini made it into an opera. Oh, right. Of course. <laughs> of course he did. Yeah, yeah. right. I didn't know it was that ubiquitous, though, still. So yeah. when you were 14, did you? does this mean you left on your own by yourself and came to the States? Um, I don't exactly remember the sequence of events. Um, I know that my grandmother was more than happy to take her only granddaughter and extract her from the misogyny and the patriarchy. Mm-hmm. Okay. And, yeah. where, and where did you go? I uh, ended up up in Washington State okay. yeah, in the Northwest because, you know, my mom was like University of Washington kind of person. And go Huskies, I guess. <laughs> if you have to. Good school. Yeah, you know? it's okay. Because I had already been so different, popping into rural Americana and being different, I mostly came with... Oh, um, you weren't in Seattle. This no, was out no, in the no, sticks. No, no, yeah, in the sticks. Oh, and so I poor thing. Sh well... Though it was a slower pace. Mm -hmm. So it gave me room to adjust to America. I also came with um, urban bias and snobbery and urban elitism okay. against... Yeah. I was just thinking because I interviewed Carol Queen yeah. two weeks ago and yeah. she's from the rural Northwest as well, sort of. I mean, yeah. although she was never from a city, but she's from a tiny town in Oregon and you've were in the... Her tiny town in Oregon is where my ancestors settled. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Yeah. We, oh, yeah. right. Wow. That, that, this town, uh, yeah. yeah, there's another connection there that Carol and I have, but yeah, that's yeah. so funny. Okay. So you're in rural Washington state with your mom and grandmother? No, my mom stayed in Japan. Oh, who, who's with you? Who are you living my with? My grandmother. Okay, she came with yeah. you. And you went to high school there, I take it? Yep. Okay. And I, now, mind you, I didn't read or write English when I came over. Oh, no way. Mm. And I spoke a family pigeon. Oh, wow. And Because the only person I spoke English with was my grandmother. I spoke Japanese with my mother. Oh. At some point, it shifted to really? English. But okay. Yeah, I mean, everybody, I, my first language is Japanese. That was the language I was competent in. I carried around a a bilingual dictionary in order to communicate with my grandmother, mm. right? So I didn't read or write English. Disconnected and unmoored yeah. still, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And so I'm you know, suddenly dropped into American teenage culture rural American teenage culture. And they did this thing of get in cars and like on Friday night or Saturday night, like go up and down pointlessly a street. Cruising. Yeah. Uh -huh. I didn't understand it. Yeah. I don't either. I pretty much immediately found other nerd kids. Ah. Yeah. So I didn't do band camp, yeah. but I was in uh. art guild and drama guild and academic decathlon and yeah. <laughs> was it, was it by any chance, was it other kids who watched the TV show Nova with Carl Sagan? Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. And uh, billions did... and billions. <laughs> <laughs> I just had a feeling yeah. there was some connection there to Carl Sagan. You know, he's he's the cause of many of our ills in society. Yeah. Yeah, cause of, he creates billions. bad people. Uh, how'd you get here? Well, why did you see. get here? Uh, it's time for me to apply to college. Now, I didn't really. Okay, so this is like really stupid uh, because I had. I had no, at this point, I, by the time I'm applying to college, I had no adult supervision. Good for you. Yeah, right. Great. Me neither. Yeah. And I didn't know anything about no adult supervision or guidance. Hmm. Um, yeah. My grandmother had passed on and I was in privately arranged foster homes. Oh, you were really? Oh, you were in a foster home? Yeah. yeah. I was not in a foster yeah. home. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Wow. And, uh, you know, I was a smart enough kid, well enough behaved, you know, so nobody actually gave me guidance on college selection. So I just took the big book of college and I eliminated by SAT points, having no idea about 
you know, I, I probably in hindsight wish somebody would have told me Yale, Princeton, Harvard, and I wish somebody would have told me those. You had to slum it and go to Cal Berkeley. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I applied to <laughs> Stanford, waitlisted, uh -huh. um, and I wrote out my own like own applications and all that because and like the high school counselors were useless. Mm -hmm. Totally. So yeah, I'm just trying to do this myself, and I really just eliminated by SAT scores, and I knew I wanted to be in a city because I missed the city, right? So yeah, I ended up with Stanford, Berkeley, and my my. Um, Final choice was University of Washington, and I thought if I can't get to UW, I don't deserve to go to college. <laughs> I couldn't get into any of those schools. So you went to Berkeley in the eighties. Yeah. Oh, okay. And and what was that like? I for wish you? I didn't. Really? Why? Yeah, because it was like a five-year sentence of uh, thirty thousand undergrad. Yeah. And I wasn't assertive because oh, I didn't yeah. know. I just thought the way that my grandmother explained university, because this she went to university in nineteen sixteen. Mm. Okay. That's impressive. All right. For a woman. Yeah. For anyone, as but especially a, a woman. As a 16-year-old. Oof. Yeah. You come from some smart people. Yeah. Like she taught herself to read. Wow. As a kid. You come from, from the some... milk bottle. Yeah. Like, yeah. But in, the way that I figured is if I got to college, I'll figure out what I'm passionate about. No. And in a sea of 30,000 undergrads where essentially we're just money we're just income for the grad schools. Mm -hmm. Nah, never saw a professor, all TAs, you know, class of a thousand. I mean, econ one, Jesus Christ. I mean, it's the Zellerbach theater. I know. Yeah, you know? I know. I'm a big critic of universities, yeah. so you can say whatever you want about them. Yeah. Um, psych one, you know, so I kind of had this vague idea that I seemed to be vaguely, in, you know, I, I had no idea. I just kind of took a bunch of classes. Okay. Right. In hindsight, you know, so I ended up with, I'd like to say that I, I majored in small talk, <laughs> you know, general psych. But then in the 80s in Berkeley, it was so much um, emphasis on either abnormal psych. Yep. Um, or lab mice psych. Mm. I thought, yeah, I thought you were talking about the people for a second who live in Berkeley, but yes, you know, I think it applies to both uh, the academic program there and the people who live yeah, there, and yeah. both so, the mice and the abnormality. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of both. And I, you know, I got the degree and I, you know, I, I know I had no thesis. I just kind of checked off the things and kind of got the diploma and whatever in hindsight though. Uh, I probably would have done better in social. Like I loved, there was a class, one, like one off class, like a visiting professor, food anthropology. And there was another class on the American way of death, Ooh. which was essentially how the rituals of death changed in New England. Mm -hmm. right? So that, and like both food anthropologies, as well as like, um, uh, there was a class on, um, New England architecture and anthropology, right? And I did horribly in, in like the that grade wise because I wasn't and I'm going to be an anthropologist. I was like, oh how curious and interesting. And then food anthropology was great because I got exposed to Southern American food rituals. Yeah. I had no idea. That's the good stuff. It was so exotic. Mm -hmm. Like because you know and, del I knew, and I, delicious. I knew nothing of this. Oh, and my only exposure to the South at this point is basic training because somewhere in there I enlisted. Oh goodness! Yeah, I forgot about okay, that this part. is okay. Yeah. We got to do this. Okay, yeah. so first of all, first of all, you landing in the Bay Area in the 1980s. That's significant in terms of time and place. Right. Right? Yeah, right. right? We'll yeah. talk about that in a second. Yeah. What What the fuck do you mean you were in the military? Uh, in high school, um, to be yeah, blunt. I kind of just well. Really just on a whim because uh, the uniform looked good and there was some unspoken itch. Uh, the recruiter showed up in the high school and I enlisted. In the U.S. Army? U.S. Army. When you were a high school student in yeah. rural Washington? Yeah. Uh-huh. And how long were you in the Army and what did you do there? Um, I ended up in active reserves and uh, because I was, I had already been accepted to Berkeley and the recruiter, I think, must have been like cha-ching when they saw me. Like, hi. They got me into a reserve unit locally. And the only position open was cook. <laughs> 
but the recruiter talked to the the commander of the unit and oh we got a berkeley grad um okay if the kid signs up for for our otc you had already graduated from berkeley no, 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 oh, no. Okay. Kid going to, oh, accepted going to, to Berkeley. Going to, yes. The unit is in San Francisco. Kid wants to be in the reserves. She's you, smart. She's smart. You got a position. Mm. Yeah, we got a position as a cook, but if the kid signs up for ROTC, we'll like nullify her commitment for as a cook because me being a cook is a really bad idea. Mm. Okay, my mother taught me amazing things about how to prepare a meal which is ordering. Mm. It's the Tokyo way. Oh, absolutely. You don't make your own food. Right, it's like New York City. Yeah, you go to a diner. Yeah, same thing. Yeah, great. Exactly. Yeah, I love a good uh, Greek diner. So what they make you, you do know? in the army. Well, I, and, oh, and so in hindsight, right, my enlistment thing is I realized that I was essentially creating my own rite of passage. How so? Well, I grew up in a all-female, intellectual, feminist household, a non-physical environment, and a and lefty pacifist and the army is none of those things yeah right although you could argue that it's socialist in fact people have argued it is socialist it is it is it's socialized defense that's right yeah that's right and so it exposed me to people i had never met before it also exposed me to my own physical potential in a lot of ways it quite literally gave me my command voice Hmm. because um then i ended up Going to Berkeley at the same time that I'm going through ROTC. Okay. Yeah. And you said it's something about you learned how to do public speaking through yeah. this, right? And what, yeah. were, what was your, what were your tasks, assignments? Well, cause my, then my, after my commission, I ended up getting my, it was, it was like my third choice, but I got my second choice. I got my commission, uh, in, uh, military intelligence. Oh, I know it sounds sexy, but it's not. It's mostly about how to give briefings. That and, can, well, it turned out to be quite sexy. Right, right yeah, giving briefings. So my, my unnatural attachment to flip charts and analog modes of presentation oh, yeah? has to do with being able to give a situation and a mission briefing it, with the minimum amount of technology. Now, as like, you know, an, an old veteran kvetching here, these kids and the young soldiers today doing PowerPoint presentations, grr, grr, grumble, grumble. And back in my day, I could just use a pile of sand and a bunch of rocks. <laughs> but I can. Huh. Yeah. So thank you, Uncle Sam, mm-hmm. for this. Yep. Yeah, but you used it for nefarious reasons. I did. Purposes. I did. That's good. Oh, my God. And I had I would have so much fun during um, officer basic course in various uh, intel schools. You know, the, the officer hanging out time, the, the, the off hours, right? And oh, back in the day, um, this was a period where peace accidentally broke out. Mm-hmm. Like for, an unwanted mm-hmm. disease for Co- politicians. A couple minutes there. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah perestroika and all that. Mm-hmm. I, the idea that I would actually go see combat just seems so far because there were really, you know, the handful of professional soldiers, mm-hmm. right? Ollie North and the like, yep. right? But they were like special far away people. You know, most soldiers were like just you know, go do your four years, you know, get your GI bill, whatever, you know, or get out of jail. So, okay. So I don't really see Midori emerging yet, right? Oh. I don't see, but, so like, get this, okay. get this. So, Are there glimpses of this? Yes, there is. Okay, good. Because, all right. So the off hours with the other officers, uh-huh. I would show up wearing peace sign t-shirts. Uh-huh. Right? Uh-huh. Yeah. And they were like, ah, oh, you're, you're wearing a piece of, you know, I'm comfortable. I'm like, yes, yes, according to the Constitution and the ideals of this nation, if our politicians and our diplomats are doing their job, we should have a standing army that is bored. Wouldn't you agree? <laughs> Don't you defend the Constitution? See, I thought you were going to start talking about, like, the eroticism of the uniform. Oh, no, no, no. It's, it's causing framework shift. Yeah. Thinking bigger picture. Mm-hmm. Right. And also using their tools maybe against them. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Right. So. So it all connects. Yeah. It all connects. Let's do that. Yeah. So 19, so you're in the 1980s again. Now, so you've been in the army. You're an army veteran, which first of all makes you exotic in Berkeley. I know. Weird, right? Totally yeah. exotic yeah. in Berkeley, my hometown. Oh, my God. And then I remember once. All right. So at one point, uh, I hated them for that. They assigned me as like the, the cadet commander of Razi. 
which was how really, tall are you by the way yeah five two yeah yeah i don't know about these people yeah. anymore i don't know if yeah. we're safe i think they were actually trying to give me a challenge to see if i'd step up i don't know how well i did because there were others let's, that were, let's give the commanding yeah. position to the five two half japanese girl that'll yeah make, that'll make us safe who's as a country. like seemingly lefty and not sure if and she's she, a, some yeah. kind of communist peacenik yeah yeah who so i'm like oh, might shit. have abnormal interest in sex too yeah. so i think we should make her the commander yeah, yeah and sense. so they were yeah, I think it was definitely a learning opportunity for me. But one day, the ROTC table in Sproul Plaza, mm -hmm. right? And there were a whole bunch of uh, folks protesting. As they do on right? Sproul Plaza and often. I'm just in my going to school clothes, and I weasel my way into the pro protest, and I'm protesting my own table. Nice. And the NCOs, the, the instructors who are who are actually soldiers, are looking at me like, could, look, giving me this look like, Cadet, what are you up to now? Was the look I was getting. Uh -huh. And I'm in the back, like protesting, and I kind of get my way next to the guy that's the loudest. And, I'm, and, and then I'm like, and I'm pro and, uh, protesting and kind of like giving a wink to the people at the, the tables. And my classmates are looking at me like, what is wrong with her? And then I said, yeah, but you know what? Maybe we actually should be protesting West Point and the Citadel. I mean, don't you think it would be better to have, like, you know, ROTC, these guys get, like, a liberal education and, like, infect them with our ideas and, like, send them out? And then the chief protester was like, you got a good point there. And uh, uh, you got a good point there. Blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, yeah, you know, I think maybe it's that we need to like, like give them educational integration into what we're doing. Uh, and hey, we got a meeting coming up next week. Hey, you know, I'm na my name's Bob. What's your name? You know, Cadet Commander Midori. Nice to meet you. <laughs> so your politics were pretty standard left wing, anti war, mm -hmm. really bad for the army. Yeah. What about your sexual politics? I, I'm I'm very busy trying to pigeonhole you yeah, as a yeah, sex yeah. person, and yeah, you're yeah. resisting. So I, I, want, I, I want you to now okay. submit. Okay. All right. Let's see. So be a sex person now, yeah. Midori. Okay. Good. Thank you for taking orders. Okay. Yeah. So let's see. High school dating. I didn't. I didn't because I assessed that most high school boys seem stupid. True. Yes. True. Good assessment, and I was. You know, that foreign Asian student focused on my GPA. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Army, good sex, fun sex, but mostly stressed out and, and not achieving successes. Right, but were you thinking about it? Oh, Be I was sexing with myself. Beyond, beyond. I mean, yeah. in, the way, in the ways that you think about it now. Yeah. Like, were you making it into an intellectual project as well? Were you curious about it beyond just the yeah. way that most people are? Yeah, uh, my... My first encounter with another person, not my hand, not the shower head, mm -hmm. first partnered sex was entirely on my own terms. And I realize now as an adult talking to other people that first sex being, you know, first partnered sex being uh, completely planned, orchestrated, choreographed with sensory input and all of that with yeah please just, is, please tell us more wait it was completely said in your hands yeah your first encounter yeah what do you mean and it was premeditated yeah. planned how oh, so yeah. what tell what happened what went down i was in high school i had gone to a, a symphony concert of mozart's requiem and there's some fancy thing that happens afterwards so i tagged along with with some adult okay. in the foster family uh -huh. and apparently a gentleman heard my voice uh -huh. and decided to find out who I am. A gentleman? Yes. How old was he? Well, he was so an older man, uh -huh. five years older. Okay. You know, when you're 18, 23 is like, ooh. It sure is. Now I think 23 and I'm like, you're not even hatched as a human. Correct. Your executive functioning haven't developed and your skull hasn't fully fused yet. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> but, you know, when I'm an 18-year-old girl who deemed that all teenage boys are stupid, and try arguing that point, <laughs> listeners, okay? 23. Ooh, on the cusp of 24. And you took control and of this? he worked and had his own apartment. 
Ooh. How did you take control of this situation? Uh, so he went and through various channels of a small town gossip, right? Found out who I am and finally called me. And of course, I know that he's pursuing me because everybody's calling to tell me. He calls me at my foster mom's home and, and then, um, hi. And I'm like, oh, hi, who is this? Oh, I've been looking for you. Oh, really? Totally pretended like I didn't know. But anyhow, romance starts and he's very much like, okay, you know, you set the pace. So I'm some exotic flower, right? Because I'm experienced with myself, but not with other people. And he's the kind of guy that goes to a symphony. Hmm. 23-year-old guy in the rural Northwest that goes to the symphony. Normally that means gay. Yeah, early form of metrosexual is what he is. Okay. Right. So we have this courtship that develops uh -huh. that is around music and style magazines. And there's making out, but then he's letting me set the, the pace. And then I realize that there's this one night where I am unaccounted for to the adults, the senior all night out party. Mm. So this is where my collaboration thing comes up. One of my friends is one of the, the high school slut girls, and she's the one I loved hearing her stories. So Monday morning, I would have her tell, I, we would be at that table in the cafeteria, and she would tell me all the things that she did. And I was just like, wow. Listen, again, like, you know, she seemed glamorous, right? And I talked to her about, okay, so I think it's going to happen and I need to get to Planned Parenthood. I had three, three levels of birth control and personal safety, okay? I had pill, sponge, and condom all at once because this girl is not going to get pregnant. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so you're very, so you're 18. Oh yeah. And then I have my birth control planned a month and a head before the all night out party. And I drop a casual note to him saying, oh yeah, so this night I'm free. Can I stay over? And I'm sure his stomach sank and his dick like went up into his throat through his internal organs with that. <laughs> and he coolly said, oh, but of course. Mm. Would you like me to have champagne for you? My goodness. And I'm like, yes. And then every day I used U.S. Postal Service to mail him a little tiny, there was this like, I think it was a taboo perfume or something, um, or some Calvin Klein perfume. Obsession. That was it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the cheesy, sexy scent. Mm -hmm. Yeah. They had this photo series of a woman undressing and then stepping up and then slipping into a black water bath and little tiny frames of it. I cut those out and every day I mailed one. You were, you were sort of almost dictating yeah. the terms of this relationship yeah. in a way. Um, yeah. But you were very clear about what you wanted mm -hmm. and what you didn't want mm -hmm. from the beginning, it sounds like, when you were I 18. didn't know what I didn't want. I knew what I wanted, which was well, high romance. No, but you did not want to get pregnant. And oh, you were yeah, very, very that's clear true. about that, that's which true. a lot of 18-year-old girls are not very yeah. clear about. Oh, right? yeah, that's true. Yeah. You were super clear. Like oh, yeah. Triple clear. Triple clear. Triple clear, yeah. right? And so the words power and autonomy come yeah. to mind, right? Which I know are two words you yeah. use a lot, right? Yeah. So at a very, very early age, basically at the beginning, yeah. essentially, of your sexual life, yeah. right? You are already establishing those things. And there was a narrative to it. Mm. There was a story. And the way that I would look at the 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 fancy porno posters, mm -hmm. there oh. was a story. Okay. Right. Which there was is... a romance and desire. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, drama, and, the good kind of drama. And it's glamorous because you're yeah. sending them these pictures, these yeah. glamorous photos. Yeah. Right. And I added to the glamour uh, and then I had orchestrated my friends to be my alibi and I'd be at the senior night party and I'd be seen by all the teachers. And I knew that I had been pretty much profiled as a nerd girl. So as long as they see me once, my alibi is set. And the bad girl, the slut girlfriend, was at the back door with her truck because she was the one friend I had that had a car. Mm. And she would take me there and pick me up in the morning under condition that I tell her everything. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I got, you know, it takes a village to get me fucked. <laughs> <laughs> that is totally not what Hillary said. But, but hey, 
Yeah, it was, and that was great. And then, uh, and she certainly didn't mean it. And I showed up in like, you know, it's the eighties, the pleated jeans and my Berkeley sweatshirt and and boyfriend and I were very much into like elegant dressing as much as I could as a high school kid in a foster home. And he looked crestfallen. And then I step into the bathroom and start throwing out my clothes. And I step out in lingerie, yeah. which I had as a high school kid to try to buy lingerie in, in rural Northwest. The fishnet stockings, I took fishnet tights, cut it, and handmade the damn thing because I had a certain image that I wanted to have. You knew what you wanted. Oh, yeah. yeah. Very and early aesthetically. on. Yeah, aesthetically, right? Yeah. Okay. And I got on top. Oh, my God. He had me on top. I was like, I, I don't, and now that I think about it, I'm you like, You were oh. on top oh, yeah. then? Yeah. My goodness. Okay. Knew nothing about kink in the sense that people know about kinks now, but I dictated the situation. Oh, and the next day, you know what was sweet? Was he took one of the um, fishnet stockings and wore it as a cravat. <laughs> so cute. <laughs> and then I had a florist deliver a single red rose to him. It's all very, it's a high style. Yeah. Right? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. And you're in rural Washington doing yeah. this. With this. Yeah. It's, you're creating, you're yes. creating this fantasy world of high style and elegance and glamour that's highly sexualized in a place that is none of those things. Exactly. It's the opposite of those things. Yeah. I've been there. Yeah. What, you know, rural Washington is not sexy or glamorous in those ways, but San Francisco was. Mm -hmm. And when you were here as a Berkeley student, you must have popped across the bridge occasionally and seen what was going on over here? Not really. No? My 74 Volkswagen Bug was really not so, working so well. So I ask again, how the fuck did you become a Dory? Like, what the yeah. hell? I mean, how did you get here to this? So you, you arrive in the middle of the AIDS crisis, yep. right? The yep. height of the AIDS crisis, right? Yeah. Mid-80s, I guess. Oh, yeah. And I know you became and involved. And, in and while I was in college, I had my head in my books and just trying to pay my rent. Mm -hmm. And... Kind of socially isolated because I didn't, you know, 30,000 students. I didn't really find a place I fit in. Uh, I also was not all that socially skilled. Um, still awkward. Now the thing is finding other awkward people. Interesting. Great. Um, I ended up in moving to San Francisco, getting a tiny apartment in Haiti, Ashbury, and working a no going nowhere admin job in a Japanese trading company that I hated. Um, and then I started, this is back when there would be ads in the paper for erotic poetry reading. And there would be these like events and, you know, only shot, only only child, awkward, shy kid who's very curious and actually really want to make friends and is curious about sex and glamour, I start going to events and I would be dressed up and because I like dressing up mm. and it seemed appropriate to dress up and it gave me an opportunity to dress up. I was also going to the opera as well because if I got standing room, I could go for 10, uh, five bucks. Hmm. So I would go to the opera dressed up. If I'm dressed up and well behaved, people started talking to me. And some of the first people that cruised me, cruised me, Robert Lawrence and Carol Queen. Uh -huh. So the some of the first people who took notice of oh. who is this, you know, I'm dressed interestingly. I'm obviously shy. And seemingly well-mannered. And, yeah. So what did they think of you? What did they do with you? We got to be friends. Mm -hmm. And they suckered me into the whole sex-positive subculture. Yeah. Which by... Wasn't calling itself that then. But like, now we're talking about sort of the 90s at this point? Early 90s. Yep. Yeah. yeah. It wasn't calling itself that. So how did and it... And then I started going to nightclubs and, you know, gay dance clubs at the I-Beam and the Kendall Club and the... Uh, yeah. Um, Trocadero, mm -hmm. you know. So what was sex positive about it? What was this movement at that well, time? the movement at the time was this whole idea that that sexuality and all the expressions of sexuality, not having sex, but being a sexual being, mm. 
is a part of one's human right, which is very different. I think some people think sex positivity is about go out and fuck people mm -hmm. a lot, mm -hmm. as opposed to sexuality is a part of the complex fabric of who you are, and you should be able to make the choices that are best and right for you. Right. And correct me if I'm wrong, it's also not inherently dangerous or bad. That's also, the sex is not inherently dangerous or bad. That's part of sex positivity, right? Right. About yeah. being able to make the best decisions for yourself. Right. Yeah. It's not something to be avoided and shunned, mm -hmm. right? Something to be investigated, explored, embraced, celebrated, right? That it is a developmental part of the homo sapien species. Mm -hmm. So again, with the evolutionary perspective here. Now, that's a tough position to take at that time in this place. Yeah. Right. You were up again. You were, this was now AIDS, the AIDS crisis had basically just peaked you yep. know, it was still ravaging yep. this city in particular and to come out and be sex positive when sex is being blamed for the deaths of all these people must it, have been difficult. It was in, I don't know if it was difficult. It was more hopeful. Yeah. It seemed. Was it? I yeah. mean, cause, but then you had, that was the movement to stop all the all the gay sex that was causing the AIDS, right? That's what even right. among gay activists, right? That was what I mean, that's what was being said. And that's why marriage became the big the big issue. Yeah, was yeah. To, to get the people out of the bathhouses. And there's a certain uh, And out of the bushes, right? Yeah. And because and all through this, um there's also a, if you will, a naivety. Um, a naivety that I have that I think for me it, it all the death that was going on and all the hateful things that like politicians were saying it just seemed like what these people were saying seemed humane and compassionate mm. yeah mm. that's it yeah was there and it made sense was, to me. But there must have been more about gay culture here, mm -hmm. if there is such a thing, or gay yeah. cultures here yeah. that must have been interesting to you or yeah. attractive to you. Yeah. Or, or um, being able to... There seemed to be a broader way to have fun, mm. a bigger way to have fun, that it wasn't just tab A, slot B. That like going to a gay dance club and sweating and dancing and the body's bumping up and down, bump, bumping up and grinding and dancing and then some hot boy going, girl, you are hot. And knowing that this was not a danger signal, that it was a, I'm hot. Mm -hmm. It's positive, yeah. not negative. Yeah. yeah. And uh, before we had the language around consent, consent and conversation was already being, already happening on the ground. Mm -hmm. And what do you want to do? What do you don't want to do? Hey, these are things we could do. I, I'm just so honored that you said that my hometown was the place where there were more ways to have fun. Yeah. That's so great. I don't think it's true anymore, but it, certainly in the eighties, I think that's yeah, right. Yeah, eighties and nineties. It was. Oh my God. And for More, those of you yeah. who are new to San Francisco, you so missed it. You did. The seventies yeah. were even better. But oh my God. Yeah. More ways to have fun. And that was appealing to you, even yeah. though you come from a couple of cultures that weren't super excited about fun. Well, right? It was creative. Because Queen Victoria was not known right. for her fun, and ni neither was post-war Japan. Yeah, at it, least parts of it. Right, major and, parts of it. And right. I think for what appealed to me is that there was that there were more options, and the fun was a broader way. That which was sexy and sensual wasn't tabé, sloppy sex. Mm -hmm. That there were all sorts of ways, and that me dressing up in all the ways that I liked it. I don't dress up for Halloween anymore. I used to dress up for Halloween all the time because Halloween was the only thing I could. Mm -hmm. Now, every day, Halloween, you know, <laughs> Halloween, I'm in jeans and t-shirt. You know what I'm dressed up as on Halloween? Hmm. As a mild mannered middle-aged Asian lady. Really? That's my costume. I was tab A, just so you know. <laughs> so, but, but if I hang out with you, I'll be yeah, sloppy yeah, yeah. next year. That's okay. Like, that's all right. It's, things are fluid around here. Arr. Okay. Yeah. But but you didn't stay in the gay rights movement. You sort of were there for a minute, right? And you yeah, it wasn't, and your, wasn't with, ultimately your place though. Yeah. And then at this time, I'm also like 
going to trying out sex clubs, trying to uh, swingers club, going to bondage a go go, and like bondage a go go in its early days. Bondage a go go. Yeah, nightclub. Tell, tell bondage a go go yeah. happened at the Trocadero, and I think it opened in ninety two or ninety three, and I was going there like every Wednesday for like a few years while well, it was still like fun, um, but it was very underground. Um, goth industrial, little punk, not so much punk, little goth industrial. Um, and this is when like cage dancing was exotic and there was like a little bondage uh, and a dungeon play area and uh, drag queens and punks and goths and hell's angels, plenty of hell's angels and uh, sex workers. And it was like all this interesting people, <laughs> yeah. which when you think about it, sort of reflects the underground peoples of the neighborhood I grew up in. Oh, yeah? You know, think about it. The mom, that single mom that worked that night, yeah. the mafia, yep. the people, you know, the guys who kind of kept the peace and didn't seem to work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's the the, the soap land, yeah. uh, the adult bath, and then there's, you know, my, yeah. So. But they're all out now, so to speak. Yeah, yeah they're out all, at night. And, and they're having fun now. Right. In public or yeah. semi-public. Yeah. And they're rubbing against you, quite literally. Yeah. And my weird outfits yeah. and all that. And rubbing off on you. Right. I take it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, my first flogging lesson was a um, seven-foot-tall drag queen Navy veteran. Mine, who, too. No, just kidding. Yeah. Um, and her uh, stage name was God's Girlfriend. Yeah. Uh, has Naturally. Has deceased. But, yeah, she gave me a basic flogging lesson. So... Why and what was the experience like? Why did you want a flogging lesson? When were you, when was this? Oh, 94, 94. Was it just because that's what everybody was doing? It looked cool. Just looked cool? Yeah, that's it. It seemed interesting. Yeah. I mean, I. Well, wait I, a second. Yeah. Uh, I mean, okay. So you're very intellectual, yeah. right? From the get go. Yeah. Right. Still are. So yeah. was it, was it purely intellectual? See, a lot of that. I've been around a few kink people lately and I find they generally are like you in that way. Very cerebral. Yeah. Right. And often describe themselves as geeks even. And mm -hmm. you have, mm -hmm. you have described yourself as a geek Yeah, into things like science, you know, yeah, weird, yeah. to me, which is just bizarre. I don't understand anybody would ever be interested in science, but, and then, but, but with this sort of obsession or preoccupation or whatever you want to call it, you know, heightened interest in sex and sexuality, which those often don't go together. Adventure. Or maybe they do. I don't know. Adventure. I think it, uh, um, for me, it's about adventure. Oh, like uh, Star Trek. Yeah. I see. Yeah, it's Galaxies adventure. Galaxies far, far away. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. It is adventure. It is. Um, oh. Yeah. And, and me, you know, um, Star Wars versus Star Trek. I'm definitely more Star Trek. Yeah. Because there is this, this compassionate optimism. I'm curious. Um, but you I, also have a very large library, don't you, in your head? Uh, with files and file cabinets full of information um, categorized and alphabetized for not us? Not that detailed. To access? No, yeah, really? no, okay. no. I'm, I, I was kind of hoping. I definitely don't do that. You're the, not a walking library of sex no, is what you're trying to say. No, I'm, um, I would have made a very lousy researcher because, the, yeah, research. What? Yeah. I, I don't believe you. Uh, Why? Because it would, the... I'm I'm not as interested in the statistics. I'm not interested in Yeah, I'm and I I want to get like the abstract. Somebody tell me the abstract. I don't want the re I don't want to do the research. Again. Give see, me the you, executive you, summary. It's in so interesting you started you remember yeah. you started with sex as an abstract yeah. idea, as an abstraction, yeah. right? Yeah, give me highest the, level of abstraction. Give me the abstract. Huh. Give me the summary. I don't want to do the research. Um, I remember being a uh, one of the the research techs at a at Berkeley for a lab that dealt with neuroplasticity of learning. And it was like all the data point. I was like mind numbingly bored. Mm -hmm. um, uh, um, research and um, stats and details, not so much. I do like to look at larger patterns and see how they connect. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. And I, the slightly uncomfortable adventures. Uh -huh. Yeah. But I will also make sure that, you know, like my, my first sexual experience, I will go into a new thing, 
I will do just enough research, but not like to the nth degree. That's that's where I just enough. So I I have enough tools to engage in the situation. Yeah, but See, I don't need all the tools. There's a fine line for me, and this yeah. is where hanging out with kinksters. Mm -hmm. uh, I, this is the question that comes up. I mean, I am a thousand percent for communication, mm -hmm. information, all the things that you guys do. Mm -hmm. I told this to Carol Queen mm -hmm. clearly, no doubt about it. Agree with pretty much everything mm -hmm. you guys say about that stuff. Mm -hmm. But then my worry is, and I asked her this question, you know, are you worried ever that you're creating categories that become boxes or even closets, right? If, if you get, mm -hmm. I know that in the kink community and even in the queer community, there's a lot of, you know, talk about titles. And there's titles. no monolithic communities. Sure. Yeah. Titles, names, categories, I'm a this, I'm a that, you know, the dominant Ugh. submissive binary is very commonly thrown around, Ugh. right? One or the other, Ugh. very black and white. Oh, good. You're that saying. is the sound of me rolling my eyes. That That is the aural accompaniment to ocular exercise. <laughs> Spoken like a science fan. Uh, I didn't use the word geek. Yeah. So you're not a fan of the binary, apparently. Hell the no. The DS binary. Hell no. Hail, hails to the no. Yeah. Why not? Well, okay. When First of all, when a person says, I am a dominant, I am a submissive, I, that's by referring to oneself as that very limited noun, mm -hmm. you're painting yourself into a corner. Mm -hmm. There's an assumption of permanence of desire. There's an assumption that one's desire is oneself. And fixed. Yeah? And fixed over time and context. Um, that's irrational. Hmm. Right? Irrational? It is actually irrational. Why is it because, irrational? Because... I mean, I'm probably going to agree with you. But yeah, I'm just, yeah. Context, yeah. right? Okay. One yeah, can right. be dominant in the bedroom, but then you're at your mom's table on Thanksgiving. Uh -huh. Who's running the show? That's right. Okay. And the Japanese will have something to say to you about yeah, this. That's right. right. Okay. And, you know, your Nana, you know, if you're a Pacific Islander and your auntie or Nana comes at you with a flip flop, man, mm -hmm. I don't care. That's right. If you're a badass, um, fighter warrior whatever you're still going to get walloped up the side of the head right. and the uh, yeah there was a scene in uh, shaw and hobbs recently because i love cheesy ass action movies uh -huh. where um uh dwayne johnson is getting walloped by his mama who's like <laughs> you know four foot and a half uh -huh. with a flip-flop but the only the see the rock is so confident in his masculinity that he can do that yeah okay. yeah that's sorry the, mama that's the key to that yeah um yeah so oh what was i saying well Before, we were talking yeah, about yeah, yeah. these categories that, yeah. that y'all place on things so, i mean i know people use that all the time i yeah. i like to say verb not noun ah verb not noun okay so okay so let's say you know if we were like cruising and flirting mm -hmm. and uh, and instead of saying i am a dominant saying so uh i fancy topping the shit out of you tonight okay or you're really right. bringing out my fangs and my claws and i'm feeling really dominant around you right now honey right now yeah. is what's important there yeah right it's temporal yeah, it's temporal right and also and temporary yeah potentially and if if i were to say i am submissive mm -hmm. right then i'm putting myself into a box now there are enough forces in the world to put me in all sorts of fo uh, boxes damn right yeah and also if i were to say i am a fill in the blank. Let's say I am submissive, right? If I say that. And if we have a fantastic scene, right? And at the end of the scene, my desire for submission has waned. For, uh, some people who don't know this, don't know what a scene is. Oh, a scene is yeah. uh, kinky ass fucking playtime. There right. You go. Which is a little more, explain it a little more. Like, what does that mean in, within the, within the community? What is a scene? I, I, first of all, I don't even know what the fuck a community is. Well, like, so what do you mean? People by, who do kinky shit. All right. right. So let's say. So rather than just yeah. have sex, it's like. A, let's say if you and I hook up mm -hmm. and you tie me up and spank my butt, mm -hmm. that is now a scene. That's a scene. Yeah. Because what makes it a scene? Uh, how I define scene. Okay. My mm -hmm. definition of BDSM. My definition of BDSM is childhood joyous play with adult sexual privilege and cool toys. Yep. 
It's cops and robbers with fucking. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so it's the playfulness mm -hmm. and the use of toys. And the, the word scene is borrowed Which, from the land of theater and the world yeah. of theater. So there's a creating psychodrama, creating a, a play. And when, uh, you know, if we're kids and we're playing cops and robbers, that's essentially a theatrical experience that we're creating together to have fun. Right. Right. Yeah. Ra rather than just the mechanics of yeah. sex, rather than just the sex itself. Yeah. You're adding things yeah. from the world of drama and theater and right. And the, and mind. The, and the stage and the yeah. mind. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's why it's a scene. Um, I know that I know this from dominatrices I hang out with who've been on the show and they, they, they're the ones who inform me about these things called scenes. They, mm -hmm. of course, men pay them to have a scene with them over a weekend or a night. So, yeah, that's a commercial encounter. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right. And so a scene, think of it as, yeah, cops and robbers with fucking. Hmm. Um, cops and, and robbers. Cops. Uh, does it have oh, to be cops? The, no. In fact, um, Simon Says is a DS game. Well, okay. Simon Says is a dominant sum, dominance and submission game. What? Come again? Yeah. Say it. So, why? How? Huh? So Simon says, raise your hand. I see. Yeah. Lower your hand. Ah, I didn't tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you yeah. get punished too. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Simon says, bend over this bench. Okay. So, uh, Simon says, spread your ass cheeks. Okay. So you, you use the categories, you play with them, but you want to keep them contingent. Yeah, and, and, and contextual. And each individual is so complex, right? That if we think of ourselves as as having appetites instead of identities, I think it's more compassionate, not to mention more efficient in terms of how we're going to get on with our fun. Okay. Right? Yeah. Efficiency. I, again, when people talk about efficiency, I think about factories and I don't no, I in other think words, less about sex. No, it's getting to the hot stuff faster. Faster. Okay. Yeah. It's like a short story that gets to the dirty bits faster. Hmm. Yeah. I see. I like dirty talk. I also like efficiency. But dirty talk is different than yeah. what you're talking about. I mean, it, well, dirty talk can be part of it, yeah, but yeah. the talking that you're mostly talking about yeah. is communication of one's desires, yeah. one's likes and dislikes to and, the partner, right? Yeah, and can be totally spicy too. Totally cool, yeah. right? And I'm all for it. I just I worry. Um, are there people that make this drier than the sand of the Sahara? There you go. Oh hell yeah! There you go. Yeah. Are there people that take this and turn it into an administrative? Uh, Sure. Yes, thank you. That's what I'm getting oh, at. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. It can be boring as fuck. Thank you. Okay. I mean, it's like watching rope bondage that's like watching fucking paint dry. <laughs> okay? Yeah. I mean, and I teach rope bondage, and I'm like, just because you're using rope doesn't mean that it's, it's like, exciting, you okay. know? Yeah. Just... You teach rope bondage. So why? What, what's the history of that for you personally? When was the first time you experienced that? And what did you like about it? And why so, did you devote much of your career to teaching this to people? You are known as one of the, I mean, you're known as one right. of the best at this thing, right? So I wrote my infamy, I suppose. Um, and I would, I would consider myself a cultural catalyst in that I, I wrote the first English language book on and the instructional book on Japanese bondage because there was nothing out there before that. The publisher and I didn't really think it would sell much. Mm -hmm. They did a run of 8,000 copies and they figured they would have leftover. It sold out in like days. Really? Yeah. Huh. Uh, and that was 2001. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So you found out that Americans are much more interested in this than we believed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we didn't know this. But what did you like about it? Right. Or what do you like about it? Okay, so... And originally, my, originally. My exposure initially. Yeah. All right. Did you watch any... Did you watch any Westerns when you were a kid? A few. A few? Did yeah. you watch any like Batman, Catwoman stuff? Sure, yeah. yeah? Okay. Yeah. Huh? Now, what happened in Westerns and... What happened in Batman and Catwoman? Yeah. They caught the bad guys. They yeah. beat up a lot of people. Somebody gets tied up. Is there tying up? I guess in Batman. Oh, yeah. really? God, see, it's funny. Wonder Woman. You perverts notice the weirdest things. I didn't even notice there were ropes in this. There Wonder ropes. Woman. Really? There's. Think, 
the lasso of truth. Oh yeah. Oh oh sure. Right. Okay. Wonder I did. Woman, I did notice that because it was go-go Wonder Woman. It was Wonder Woman, but and yeah. the corset outfit. Yeah. And tying up the guys and yeah. Oh. Right. Remember those? Okay. Yeah. Okay, you have a cultural equivalent of that and equivalency in Japan. Okay. Okay. So you have historical melodramas that would be playing in like prime time and dinner time, and there are half hour shows where. It's set in the Edo period or the medieval past, and there's there's sword fighting, and there's bad guys captured and good guys captured, and and pretty ladies captured, and things like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so oh, I'm watching this, going, "Whoa, cool!" And it sticks in the mind, right? Yeah. Every culture has its um, darker historical truth as well as the the darker mythology of the culture. Yeah. So for every night, there is an evil warlock. Yeah. When you said the darker truth, you know, I mean, I immediately have to think about how you're running up against feminism constantly Mm -hmm. with this, right? Mm -hmm. If it's the woman getting tied up, that's not a good look for second wave feminists in the 70s Mm -hmm. and 80s and 90s. So Remember the, the vengeful Yakuza wives? Right. Oh, my God. I mean, they would... Yeah. So how did you negotiate that or how do you negotiate so that? So those images were in my head. Yeah. Okay. Much in the way that like Batman, Catwoman, Wonder Woman, Westerns. Okay. All right. Um, fast forward to college, boyfriend then. Um, somewhere along the way, one of us got the idea of, hey, let's tie each other, tie each other down to our our co-op apartment futon Uh (laughs) and you know tie me up fuck me tie you up fuck you and oh actually um jesse helms he's always a help in these situations actually he was i know because it was something that he was complaining about about some southern blue law (laughs) the lack of bondage or or yeah there was something that he was going on about sexual perversion right okay yeah because you know that's what jesse did yeah uh well he was north carolina south carolina north north carolina Mm -hmm. south North, North North Carolina, a uh, very very right wing Christian. Um, he was like the, he was like the symbol of Christian conservatism. Oh my God! Yeah. And so he was having a fuss about something or another. So mm-hmm. the Daily Cal newspaper, mm-hmm. the campus newspaper, published the sexual blue laws in different states. And so my boyfriend and I at the time decided to uh, go through them and see which one we wanted to try, <laughs> which is how <laughs> anal sex happened. Oh wait, because what? I hadn't considered that before. Oh, that's how anal sex happens. For, okay. Yeah, for yeah. So yeah, in reading like some <laughs> southern state. I wish that, I had known a long time ago. That yeah, buggery was not allowed. That I was like, what is that? What what is yeah? And then so looked it up, and then we tried it. Uh-huh. And I think somewhere in the sexual exploring. And by the way, that boyfriend was a D and D guy. Of course he was. Yeah. So, <laughs> Dungeons and Dragons, yes. for those of you listening at yes. home who don't, the, the three of you who haven't played D&D. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So he was a and d guy, right? <laughs> yeah. Uh-huh. And so I think oh, his imagination stuff and my imagination stuff, and thanks to Jesse Helms complaining about sexual perversions, we tried different things. It was like a perfect storm. Yeah, it was. I love it. Yeah. It's really quite, you know, yeah. 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 <laughs> Uh, it's really quite naive and innocent, my my journey, actually. Yeah. Mm, I wouldn't say that. So you give classes now? I do. Various kinds? I do. I give lots of different classes. Teaching people to do things and not do things? And yeah, things. teaching people to do things that would please them and to co-create joy. What's your most popular class? Or oh. no, what's your favorite class to teach? Okay, so I do a women's weekend intensive that that gives me great struggle and great joy. Um, Fort FM Women's Dominance Weekend Intensive, small group, um, eight or nine women max in person. And I have people asking, well, why don't you do these classes online? Because there's a certain interpersonal chemistry that happens Mm -hmm. that can't happen through the medium, the digital learning medium right now. Especially if it's digging into, I mean, okay, if I want want to learn how to use an accounting software, yes, leave me alone with an online course because I will feel inadequate in the face of, of financial confusion. But with something like 
digging deeply into who we are sexually and figuring out strategies and having a little more compassion about our own journeys and also kicking ourselves out of complacency, mm -hmm. right? Having Being surrounded by other amazing women who are absolute experts on themselves. People come to the class going, oh, I don't, you know, I'm completely a novice. I don't know anything about this. But each woman is an expert in herself. Hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the objective and, of the course. Is well, that right? No, she, she comes already as an expert of oh. herself. Then the objective or the mission of the weekend is actually not about making a dominant of her, because that's, again, limiting into painting yourself in the corner and into a box. It's giving each woman a tool by which, tools by which to engage in creating, co-creating joy with another, how to tap into your authentic power mm -hmm. and engage in collaborative joy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There's nothing kinky about that. No. This could be applied to any relationship. Yes. Aha. Aha. Uh -huh. This is the secret. Yes. Got it. But I'm using kink as a laboratory, a sandbox. Yep. Because in our general life, we have too many choices, too many decisions, too many variables. But what if we limited that down to remember that's that like briefing model of piles of rocks and sand mm -hmm. and I can explain anything. Yep. Okay. Yep. So if we take this little sandbox of sex where we can, where women can actually identify what would please them now and to be able to express that in a way that allows for them and another to create experience together. Hmm. It does need to start with, with her being able to identify. And, and I use her in a, a lowercase h because in terms, I, it's women's dominance intensive, but I'm going to create a much nicer gender statement around this. It's for anyone who daily lives with the bullshit of, of the misogyny against women. So Non-binary folks, uh, female-identified folks, mm. yeah. Okay. So when you say the daily misogyny, right, you got to be really specific here. Uh, daily bullshit of being a uh, walking in the world as a woman in this world. I need to come up with a better phrasing on this. I'm working on it. Yeah, well, like, uh, but what kinds of things are you talking about? Because obviously, there's been radical shifts in the culture. Yes. You know, in the last 50 yes. years, I mean, women now are 60 percent of college students, and women are taking over many of the professions, and they're you know more senator women mm -hmm. senators than ever before, and on and on and on. Right? There's more. I think MDs produced for women than men now. So we are in progress, still so not having for uh, sure. income parity. Well, what are the, let me ask you this, what you've been teaching this for a while. You've taught many women mm -hmm. in this course. What are the, what do they say about their own lives and their own experiences? And what's the, what are the problems that they're trying to address or overcome for them? To identify what their own thoughts and desires are in the moment. Okay. Now that's interesting, right? And you find that to be, I take it more common among women to be a problem that women tend, is this right? Tend not to know what they want as much? No, that's not the case. I don't okay. know. Mm -hmm. I'm dealing specifically with, uh, I'm dealing specifically with women because that was the journey that I struggled. Mm -hmm. So it's, sharing the tools that I have and I developed mm -hmm. and specifically living in a misogynistic world as female identified and femme of center. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Misogynistic and also at least in large part, anti-sex. Yeah. Sex negative world. Yeah. Right. At least in part, yeah. in part. Mostly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's yeah. split, right? I yeah. Mean, but there's certainly a lot of anti-sex going on sure in this culture is. still. All right. Look one at, la one yeah, last look question. At our education system. One last question here yeah. for you. So uh, I have a friend who's involved in the kink community around here. And um, he or she has told me that um, they feel like they can't let it be known, that they actually live in a closet, that kink might be the last closet now that the gays are out and they're all married and running for president and we've had second and third and fourth wave feminism, but 
to be kinky, part of the community actively, can't be known. You can lose your job. You could even lose your, your children. You can lose all sorts of status. Is this correct? Is it the last, is it the last closet? I don't know if it's the last closet. Is it a closet? It, is, it can be a closet depending on your demographics and privilege and what you got to lose. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, Carol Queen said, fuck off, come out, be, be brave, lose huh? your job, Hard. lose your kids. If it, if that's what it takes. I mean, it, I wouldn't say that to individuals. I mean, maybe sort of collectively, right. Coming mm -hmm. out of course is going to serve a greater good, but I'm not going to. Well, Harvey Milk said that yeah, too. Yeah, exactly. Um, and it did. Well, there are some folks who can come out. And for those who really can't support those who can and are at high risk, mm. there are those who can come out with like no risk, right? Mm -hmm. Sure. Me. Right. Uh, You're already, I, I, you, I, you were yeah. born out basically. Yeah. 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 <laughs> okay. Right. So I've already have, I already have the support structure that right. I have created around me. Right. Right. I'm out. If somebody like outed me for being kinky, I'd be like, <laughs> Um, yeah, my next class is next Tuesday, mm -hmm. next Wednesday right. in uh, Pleasure Chest. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Here's a flyer. Thank you. Right. But then, and then there are the people who can't be out, right? Because they have too much to lose. But the people who have too much to lose, they have too much to lose because they have privilege. They have privilege and they have access to things that the people over here don't. Then there are the people in between mm -hmm. that could come out, could facilitate change. Now, people like me, we're already so out that people are like, yeah, what? Now, if the world turned in the direction it seems to be turning, it's quite likely that somebody like me could be murdered. Hmm. It is a reality. You think so? Yeah. Really? In the way that gay bashing happens. Hmm. I'm out. I am a target. Maybe. Um, there are people I know that are out as I am that do get death threats because they don't live in San Francisco mm -hmm. or they live online where they are getting um, death threats and scary hacking shit. Okay. Right? So there are certain extreme risks that people that are very out have. Like, yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a reason why I'm private about where I live or where I stay. Because it would be easy. Mm -hmm. I'm a public target. Even here. Yeah. Yeah. Increasingly so here. Right. As, as San Francisco changes. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm out. I don't need help being out, but I do need help having my rights protected. So the people with privilege and people with things to lose that can't come out can do things to support the extreme end. I mean, through voting, through creating a healthier sex education in the public schools, creating more compassionate environments. And then there are the people in between. They could, they could stay in the closet or they could come out. In this area, this is where the future of the politics is, right? You're always going to have outliers the Harvey Milks, you're going to have the Malcolm X's, you're going to have the Carol Queens, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. Then there's the gray flannel suits, but there's the in-between. Right. And if we can shift to just a little more safety, just a little more support. Which is happening, isn't it? It seems to me kink has had an influence on the broader culture over the last 10 to 20 years. It has, but There's it is language all, that's new that I think comes from kink. There can always and, and, queer, and queers it, too. when Stephen Colbert uses safe word. Yeah. And, but and consent is, it can always, always shift back. Sure. It's, it's like we did, we didn't think that reproductive rights would be dug it back into the dark ages and yet it is in certain states yeah yeah well certain states you know it's it's easy for us sitting in san francisco sure. but you know the certain states is still this country mm -hmm. and this country is still this world indeed and when you know some kid in alabama is not getting the the safe accurate information to make the best decision that they can it's actually affecting not only national security, but we're also affecting the economy. Hmm. 
how's that? I just made a big leap, right? That's okay. You might right? be right. Yeah. How, but how, would, how does it affect the economy? Okay. So when that person is denied reproductive rights and having to make decisions that are different around their education and career. Right. Right. Next thing you know, they have two, three, four, five, six, seven kids, which well, is what... Mar it's actually not the number of kids because people should get to choose to have the children they want at the age they want. So if somebody at 17 is choosing to have a child, but, we also can't shame them for that, right. but they should be able to make the reproductive right reproductive yeah. decisions that's right for them. I'm agreeing life. with you. Yeah. I'm just saying, this is what Margaret Sanger's argument yeah. was. You know, when they don't have when people don't have access to birth right. control, exactly. This is what happens. Th there is a tendency though that to automatically think of young parenthood as being automatically bad. There is a tendency for mm. now. I'm some and and that is there is a conversational bias in talking about um, reproductivity and youth. That you know the the focus being don't get pregnant mm -hmm. as opposed. So let's make the smartest life decisions for you. Okay. Right. If you're going to, if you want a family, super. Okay. Let's talk about how do we budget this? Yeah. Okay. If you want to have, okay. If you're going to have a kid at a certain age, um, do you have, what's your healthcare options? What, and is there even a fucking healthcare option? Mm -hmm. Right. And when you have a population that feels disempowered, to make decisions that are best for their success, it actually affects our um, national economy and instability of economy. The fewer children, I mean, I keep coming back to this, but it's mm -hmm. true. The fewer children, the more likely it is to be a wealthy society. I mean, that's just, that's just the way it's gone yeah. down. And yeah. so, I mean, when we introduced birth control, we actually right. increased our productivity in a lot of ways for right. obvious reasons. And, right? somebody, and women and women especially, and, right, could now work. And if somebody decides to have a child at 20 yeah. or 40, I hope it is that the people that are having that, that child are doing so with the best decision. And, you know, you can never make the best decision because the future is unknown, but to at least be able to say, yeah, this is a choice I'm making. Yeah. And I'm going to understand the sacrifices I'm going to have to make. And, and, uh, here are the other options that I have. And, you know, I've had friends who've had kids early and at 40, they're free and adult and they're hanging out with their adult child. Yeah. And another friend who's 40, who's just thinking about having a kid. And they're like, I'm going to be 60 when the kid is, you know, so these, these are, you know, pros and trade offs. Cons. That's they're right. Trade offs, you know? Yeah. Yeah. So you don't live in a closet. You're trying to break down another closet. Oh, you know what for me is a closet? What? That's, that's not a closet, but that which I hesitate before saying is atheism. <laughs> Okay, this is funny. Tell me why. In the U.S., it's easier to say I'm queer than to say I'm an atheist. Oh, really? Yeah. yeah. I don't know. It's kind of changing, isn't it? There's a big atheist movement now. They're kind of they have big podcasts. Those atheists, I know that. Travel anywhere outside of New York, San Francisco, oh. L.A., or Seattle. Oh yeah. Okay. Sure. Right. Yeah. Go to Alabama and say that it doesn't go over too well. Yeah. Or Go to Walnut Creek. Yeah? Go to Walnut Creek. I'm going to after this. Yeah. yeah. Go to Sacramento. Go to Bakersfield. <laughs> and, <laughs> and say, I don't believe in God? Yeah. Okay. Really? That's You find that to be more oh, yeah. of a closet? I am, hmm. I am going to gauge the room's temperature before I talk about being a non-theist. Yeah. Huh. Well, Midori, uh, all I have to say to you is um, keep doing what you're doing. And good luck out there. Hey, thanks. You'll need it. Yeah. Don't you think? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, without you, I, want, <laughs> I, want, I, wonder, I wonder how far we would be, you know, in our sexual culture. I think you've added quite a bit of freedom. Oh, thank you. Yeah. No, thank you. <laughs> and thanks for doing this. This is the Unregistered Podcast, and I'm Thaddeus Russell. To experience the new Renegade University, go to renegadeuniversity.com. Thanks for listening.